Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about billiard models. So this seems to be a departure from the ray tracing that James was talking about last time, but actually it turns out to be the same thing. So, or very similar. So what are billiard models? You're seeing one right now. So this is just a gas made up of uh, a lot of spheres that are bouncing around inside a box. And you can see that the spheres are colliding with each other, and but but in between collisions, they move in straight lines at a constant velocity. So a constant direction and a constant speed. And uh, the colors are representing the actual speed of the sphere. So you can see that purple is a slow sphere. And when it gets hit by another sphere, it might change its speed. And uh, yellow are fast spheres. I'm just going to run that again. And um, as, as this dynamics goes on, you can see that these balls are moving around. And this is an actual simulation of a gas using classical dynamics. So this is what I could call a billiard model because you can think of these as billiard balls bouncing around a table, although that table is now in three dimensions. So how could we actually simulate this? So let's think about the simplest possible uh, system. So we'll just have one ball to start with in a box and we'll think about two dimensions. So let's look at that. So here we are. Here's a two dimensional table billiard table and uh, here is a ball and I'm going to move that ball around the table right so the dynamics uh, so uh, I had this all carefully set up and now it's not working so uh, so that's the let, let's say that's the original position of the ball and now I'll draw another ball and uh, move that ball around so we can see you know so the ball starts here and it's going in some direction and the dynamics is just going to be that this ball moves until it hits the wall and then it bounces off and moves and move, bounces off and uh, continues in a straight line until it hits the next wall. And so if we use the technique of time stepping that James was discussing in the last lecture, what would we do? We would start off with some initial position and some initial velocity. And then um, we would take this ball, which is now an ellipse apparently, and uh, we would move it following that velocity vector by taking a little time step. So we would take a small delta t and move this, move it by that amount in that direction for one time step and then move, do another time step. So it's actually difficult to do this with this software, sorry. But you can see that I'm going to take time steps. I'm going to draw the time steps in. The center of the sphere is moving along in a particular direction until it hits the wall. And then we'll do this. We'll take a normal vector and then reflect in that normal vector uh, and carry on in the next direction, etc. And so we'll get this, uh, this disk bouncing around inside this um, billiard table. Okay, so uh, how could we actually simulate that? Well, we could do this time stepping, but that seems to be inefficient because these little steps are, uh, you know, we're doing a lot of calculations, we're checking. Have I hit the wall yet? Have I hit the wall yet? Every little step, we're checking the same thing again and again. So there's a much more efficient way of doing this, which is instead of taking these little time steps, we'll just take one big time step or one big jump, which is from the current position to, you know, from this current position, I'll jump straight to the position where the, uh, the, the sphere has actually hit the wall, right? And so, uh, so how can I do that? So that's what we're going to look at today. So I want to actually calculate the intersection time of this when this sphere or disk collides with the wall by following this straight line ray. Okay. And it turns out that one way of doing that is by thinking about it as follows. So if I have just one, one wall, which I'll call a plane, and the center of the disk, let's look at the center of the disk. It's moving in some direction. And I'm interested in when the disk hits the wall. And that will happen when the center of the disk is at a particular distance from the wall, which is the radius of the disk. So let's call the radius of the disk R. And so it turns out that actually what I can do is just look at the dynamics of the center of the disk moving around. And I've actually um, shrunk the table by an amount in each direction, which is the same size as the radius of the disk. And then it's totally equivalent to just look at one particle, which has zero size, just a point particle moving around in the same way and bouncing off this wall. And you see that this is exactly the ray tracing problem that James was talking about. So th this is why I say that these models are really equivalent. Okay, so let's actually see how to calculate this intersection time. So suppose I have a general plane 
Uh, so I'll call that wall a plane because I, I'm thinking that it could be in two dimensions or it could also be in three dimensions. So a general plane in two dimensions, how am I going to represent that? Well, uh, it's going to be AX plus BY equals C. So there's some constants A, B, and C here. And um, the X and what side, uh, so it's, it's basically the set of X, Y pairs, X comma Y pairs in the plane which satisfy this equation. And I can rewrite that as X, the vector X, using this dot product dot the normal vector equals uh, a constant. But that constant is actually going to be equal to p dot n, where p is a point on the plane. So I have a normal vector, which is perpendicular to the plane, and then a point p on the plane. And I have um, all of the points x on the plane are given by this equation. And why is that? That is because you can see that the vector between x and p has to be perpendicular, which is x minus p, has to be perpendicular to n, the normal vector. And therefore, x minus p dot n is equal to zero. And that gives me this, x dot n is equal to p dot n. So that's how I can describe the plane. And now how can I describe my, the tra trajectory of my particle? So what does the trajectory look like? I'm going to start at some position. Let's call it x0, which is a vector. And then I'm moving in a some direction, which I'll call v, the velocity. And the question is, well, where does the particle get to after a time t? So at time t, I'm somewhere along this ray or straight line. And we can write down a formula for the position at time t. So the position at time t of this particle is going to be x, x vector at time t equals the initial position plus the number t multiplied by the velocity. Sorry. So this is the um, equation of a straight line uh, parameterized by time in vector form. So we can write that out in two dimensions as x, y vector plus t times u, v vector, which is splitting the velocity into its two velocity components. And so that's x plus t times u and y plus t times v. That's a, uh, maybe uh, an easier way to think about it, but you can see that this is equivalent to writing it in this vector form. So now we have the trajectory and we have the plane and we want to know when those two things coincide. So when does the trajectory reach the plane? So the intersection, so we have a fixed plane and this moving trajectory with this parameter t. Intersection of the trajectory and the plane, well we have to satisfy that the position at time t is on the plane. And that means that the position at time t minus this point, fixed point on the plane has to be perpendicular, uh, sorry, yeah, has to be perpendicular to the normal vector. And we, since we have our formula for the position at time t, which is x plus t times v uh, minus p dot n, that has to be equal to zero. So let's call the intersection of the trajectory and plane that's going to happen at one particular time. So let's call that time t star. And so I actually need a t star in here, sorry. x of t star is on the plane. t star times v minus p dot n is zero. And that actually enables me to derive a formula, an exact formula for this t star, the intersection time, which is going to be given by p minus x dot n divided by v dot n. So that is a formula for the intersection time of my ray with you know, known position, initial position, x0, sorry, and known velocity. That's the intersection time with the plane. So what does that actually mean? Well, I have my plane with some point on it, and I have some initial position, x0, and a velocity, v. And so this intersection point, x star, x of t star, uh, so what I'm actually doing is I'm calculating the distance away from the plane in a perpendicular direction, and I'm saying, how fast am I moving in that direction? I'm moving at 
the array at, at a speed v dot n, which is the component of the velocity in that direction. And so this is just the standard formula for distance over um, for distance divided by speed gives me the time it takes me to get there. Great. So now what can I do? I can actually put this in a computer and do a simulation. And what would, what would I like to simulate? Well, the easiest thing to simulate is just one box like this. There's a, let's do that like this. Here's a box. And uh, I want to find when does my trajectory intersect that box. So I have a point particle living in this box and I want to find when does it intersect the box. So the first thing I need to know is, well, which side is it actually going to intersect? There are four, four possible walls or planes, you know, and depending on the angle of the trajectory, I, might, I will hit different walls first. Right? So what I'm actually going to do is extend all of the walls, sort of think of them as infinite planes or infinite lines, and I, I'll take the intersection time with each of them. So I'm going to have intersection times tau i with wall i. And there are four walls in this case. You can do a general polygon if you like. And um, then what do I need to do? So for example, let's, let's think about this, uh, this velocity vector here. And so I'm going to have an intersection time tau 1 with this wall. And then if I extend that velocity further, I'm going to have an intersection time tau 2 with the horizontal wall up there. And then I'm going to have an intersection time over here tau 3 with that wall. So which one of these do I actually want? Well, clearly I want to have a positive intersection time because I'm moving in a certain direction. So I'm only interested in positive times. And then out of tau one and tau two, which is gonna be the physical one? Well, clearly it's gonna be tau one because that is the first collision that's going to occur. Tau two will, would occur later if I didn't have this tau one in the way. And so what I actually, so the formula I'm gonna use is that I'm gonna take the min, you know, I want, I want to find the arg min over i of tau i such that tau i is positive. And arg min means find the value of i which minimizes. So I'm just going to find which wall do I collide with and, um, uh, sorry, no, that's, that's not actually right. It's not the arg min, it's the min, the, the normal minimum. I'm going to minimize these times to find the minimum collision time. And, well, actually, I need both pieces of information. What is the collision time and which wall does it collide with? And so if I have that, those, those, that piece, those pieces of information, then I can do the calculation. Okay, so now let's continue by saying, well, what happens when I hit the wall? So this is collision. So the first thing I need to do is update my position. So I'm gonna have sort of whatever my position used to be, I'm going to update it to x plus the minimum time of collision, tau min, times my velocity. And so now, you know, I had my plane, here's my particle, it's moving over there. And so now I'm updating my position to be the position I just calculated on the, the plane that it's going to collide with. And now let's draw a normal vector and calculate the and we need to do the reflection just like uh, James was talking about last time. And so if we call V the velocity before the collision and V primed the velocity after the collision, then the rule is that V primed is the velocity before the collision minus two times the velocity component in that direction. So V dot N, which is a number multiplied by the normal vector N. So where does this rule come from? One in a nice way of looking at it is to say, well, the, I'm gonna call V perpendicular. I'm gonna call that, let me remove the bar under the V just so there's not so many lines going around. So V perpendicular, I'm gonna define it to be the V dot N times N, which is the component, the vector component of the velocity in the direction of N of the normal. And that is what is going to be changed by this collision. And then I'm going to decompose my whole velocity as V perpendicular plus V parallel. So I'm actually defining V parallel like by, by, by this rule. V parallel means the, the component of the velocity in the direction that the plane is pointing. 
And then after the collision, the parallel will stay the same because the physics is telling me that in the direction parallel to the plane, nothing is changing if I assume that there's no friction, which is what I'm assuming all the way through this uh, lecture, which I didn't actually mention, sorry. And uh, so V prime, the velocity afterwards is the same parallel velocity, but now I have minus the perpendicular velocity. So I changed the direction of the perpendicular velocity. And so if you, if you look at these equations, you'll, you'll see that indeed this gives you V minus two times the perpendicular velocity. And that gives me V minus two V dot N N. So that's the rule for the collision um, with this boundary. So let's look at a visualization of that. That's done with a very nice interactive chaos package in Julia. So this uses um, the dynamical billiards package to simulate billiard models, which is what you'll be doing in homework. And it uses the Maki package uh, for 3D visualization. So I'm going to run this simulation and I can change the speed interactively. So what we're seeing here is a billiard table, which is given by two arcs of circles, half circles, semicircles, uh, joined by straight lines. This is called a Bunimovich Stadium billiard. This was uh, invented at the end of the 70s. And what's going to happen is that, so what I have here is a collection of particles which started with the same position but slightly different velocities. And um, what you can see is that they, when they hit this circular wall, they gradually start to spread out. And uh, when they hit the, par the parallel wall, they don't spread out. Uh, or they spread out sort of in a linear way. But when they hit the circular wall, they actually have this defocusing effect that we uh, have seen in um, uh, James's visualizations. And so this, uh, this billiard model, uh, so, I, so another, so this is a billiard model. So these particles are actually independent. These particles do not bounce off each other. They're basically point particles. But what we're seeing here is that the initial cloud of particles actually spreads out to fill the available phase space or set of positions and velocities. This is a chaotic and ergodic system. So this is actually deterministic chaos being shown in front of our eyes. So what that means is that two nearby initial conditions spread out exponentially fast in time. And that's due to these curved boundaries. So this is one of the reasons that these models are interesting. Okay, so, so that's the kind of thing that we'll be able to simulate once we have done this uh, homework that you're going to be doing uh, next week. Okay, so great. So, so far we've got just a, one particle bouncing around a, a rectangular box. Now let's add the interesting part, which is given by these curved boundaries. And the easiest kind of curved boundaries to simulate are uh, spheres. So let's look at how we can do that. So let's suppose we have a sphere or a disk in two dimensions, and we're going to find, uh, we're going to have a particle that's traveling in a certain direction and is going to try and collide with this disk. So um, here's my particle, and of course I'm going to think of it as a point particle, but for, with, in the same way that I did before. So here's a point particle, and it's going to collide with that disk. So let's just do the same thing, right? We could do time stepping, but that's actually not efficient. Sorry, I'm showing the wrong thing on the screen. Here we go. So I have a sphere, I have a point particle, and I have this velocity vector. And so I'm going to do time stepping until I hit the sphere, but that's inefficient. So instead of that, we're going to look for the intersection time with the sphere. So I'm going to have actually two intersections in general. One, two. Or if I'm pointing in a different direction, I might have no intersections, right? So let's do another arrow over here. And there are no intersections that never intersect this sphere. And there's an intermediate case where there's a grazing collision where it just touches at one point this sphere because the trajectory is actually tangent to the sphere. So let's actually calculate those intersections. How can we do that? So we're going to use the same same idea as before. We need a formula for the boundary of this object. So let's start with the center, which is going to be a vector C in two dimensions, or actually all of this, because we're using vectors, extends directly to three dimensions as well. And so in Julia, what we're going to want to do is write generic code that works in two or three dimensions, or in fact, in any number of dimensions by using vectors. Uh, so hopefully we'll have time to talk about that a bit. So we're going to have a radius r and a center c, and that's going to define my sphere. And so the points on the sphere are going to give, be given by points on the sphere, which we'll call x, are given by x minus c. The distance 
So that's a vector, and I want the, dist the length of that vector. So I'm going to take the norm of that vector, which is just its length, and that has to be equal to r, the radius. And it's actually more convenient to square both sides. I'm going to have the length squared equals the radius squared. And so now we have to know how we deal with this length squared. And it turns out that that I can just rewrite as x minus c dot product with itself. And so um, there we go. That is the formula for the points x which lie on a sphere. And now what I need to do is, uh, so I'm going to take, again, my ray. And I want to know when does the ray, the trajectory, intersect the sphere. And so that's going to be, I just substitute x of t star into my formula. So x of t star minus c dot with its, dotted with itself, dot product, the scalar product with itself, x of t star. minus c equals r squared. And so, uh, but I know what x of t star is. Again, it's x zero plus t times v star, uh, t star times v minus c dotted with itself. x zero plus t star times v minus c equals r squared. So I'm not gonna go through the whole derivation. This is gonna give us a formula for the intersection time t star. What does that formula look like? It's actually a quadratic equation. So you can kind of see that because I've got some kind of multiplication with this dot product. And I have a t star on the left and a t star on the right. So I have t, t star squared in, in some term in this equation. So I get a quadratic equation for t star. So it's po quite possible that this is the first time that you've ever seen an actual use for, the, for solving quadratic equations that you did in high school, which seems totally pointless, to be honest. But actually, you know, suddenly we want to find the intersection time of a line with a, a sphere because it's actually useful for a real simulation. And um, it, it turns out that that's given by a quadratic equation. And if you remember what quadratic, quadratic equations have this property, you know, if I, if I write something like a times t squared plus b times t plus c equals zero, then a key quantity is the discriminant d, which is given by b squared minus 4ac because the sign of that quantity tells me whether I'll have two roots or one repeated root or zero real roots, and the roots are complex numbers, because that thing goes inside a square root in the, you know, so the solution. Let's just write it up here. The solution is going to be t equals, plus, uh, equals minus b plus or minus the square root of the discriminant. This called the discriminant because it discriminates whether I, how many solutions I have basically, how many real solutions, divided by 2a. And so uh, you can see that, well, if d is a negative number, I, I get complex roots. And, and, and that exactly corresponds to when this intersection in physical space does not happen. So there is no intersection. And so you're going to write a, form, uh, uh, write a piece of code which returns, um, the, you know, which finds the roots. So there's, there's, there's something we need to, to, to think about, which is which is the correct root. So if I'm outside and there are two roots, then it's clear that the, the minimum of the two roots should be the correct time, as long as I'm going it, pointing in the right direction. So I need to check, am I pointing towards the sphere or away from the sphere? If I'm pointing away from the sphere, then the t intersection time will be negative. And so that's not interesting to me for the simulation. And if I'm positive, then I'm going to take the minimum of the two roots. But now if we think about the case of refraction, in the um, setting, of, uh, setting of ray tracing, what I'm going to do is I'm still going to use the same method of uh, these. So I never actually used the, the word, which is event-driven simulations. So finding these intersections, the intersections are actually events of interest. And so what I'm doing is a simulation where I go from one event to the next to the next. And that's an event-driven simulation. And so that's the kind of simulation that we use, actually, in ray tracing instead of time-stepping uh, most of the time or with these geometric objects at least. And so if I have a trajectory coming in to my lens, here's a trajectory, and then it's going to bend you know, towards the normal and then bend away from the normal again, uh, something like that. I hope I got that geometry right. So now, uh, you know, 
after this collision, we're actually going inside the sphere. And so I'll, I'll need to take the smallest positive root. And there'll be, actually, because I started on the sphere, it looks like there should be one root, one, one intersection time, which is zero, because I'm already starting on the sphere. But because we're using floating point numbers, actually that zero might be something close to zero, but not exactly equal to zero. And we have to be careful about that. And so the easy thing, easiest thing to do is to take the normal vector to the sphere. Uh, you know, here's a normal vector to the sphere at that point, And we should check, is my velocity pointing in the same direction? In other words, what is the sign of my velocity vector uh, dot n? Is that bigger than zero? If so, it's sort of pointing in the same direction as the normal. And that's what we'll use as a condition to, to check if which of these roots we should actually take into account. So that's, um, uh, that's we, we've finished, we've run out, run out of time. So uh, next time we'll look at how to actually, in, in, actually do ray tracing with these objects with colors and uh, uh, recursive algorithms. See you then.